This is Dodge Brothers Farm and Ranch. You always want to check the oil before you start any piece of equipment. The first thing I do every morning when I get the planter out is grease the gauge wheel arms and grease the lift cylinders and grease the lift wheel pivots and grease the transport lift wheel pivots. And then there's a grease circ uh, up hidden in the frame for where the frame flexes for the outside rows. And then there's grease circs on the hitch. You want to get that all taken care of. Now I got to grab the 15 16 wrench and just make sure all of these row cleaner wheels are okay. I've had one fall off before. <sighs> so I just like to give them a quick check every morning. <clears throat> And you also just want to walk around it and do a good visual inspection. Kind of look for anything that looks like it might be cracked or broken or bolts that look like they're working their way out. Loose nuts or anything. Just try to prevent any downtime during the day that you can by giving it a good look over before you head to the field. A lot of times big issues can be prevented by catching them when they're still a small issue. For instance, as we were fueling up the case tractor this morning, we noticed that there was a bolt broken and almost ready to fall out on the hitch of the VT. And that could have been really bad. You hope that your hydraulic hoses would just pop out and disconnect if the hitch broke, but you don't know for sure. You might actually tear all the hoses right out of the implement. And worst of all, if you lost those hitch bolts going down the road, it could be very dangerous. So I'm glad we caught that. We were able to put a new bolt in and not have any downtime. Okay, we've got fuel, we're all greased up. Everything checks out okay. It's time to put seed in this bad boy. This is eFlow seed lubricant. It's a mix of graphite and talc. And it helps the seed slide through the tubes. And it lubricates the uh, seed discs as they're spinning against the rubber seals to kind of keep those Seed disc's nice and slippery. All right, we're loaded with seed, ready to head to the field. Somebody asked a good question about how this blower actually moves seed from the big tanks to the tiny little mini hoppers on the row units. Well, let me show you as best I can here as I'm walking by. So the blower is hooked up to this ductwork right here that connects into this plastic manifold underneath. And if we look at it from this angle, you can see that it splits out into individual tubes and this is the view from inside the tank what you can't see is that those tubes going across have a slot on the bottom and that's where the seed gets picked up into the tube when the air blows through here it carries seed with it as it comes out these hoses and then down into the little mini hoppers on the row units and the air can blow out through this screen these lids are kind of constantly bouncing all the time releasing air out through the top it keeps it filled up to this level because it's got air holes in here and once it fills the air holes up, the seed stops coming. Hook the iPad up here. Turn the seed sense on and we'll hit the road. Okay, we have arrived. A few people asked yesterday what this box was, and this actually controls the markers on the planter as well as the folding functions. So I use my number one remote that's the same one for raising and lowering the planter to unfold it as well. So first we'll lower the three point a little bit. And then we push the wing wheels button and then push the planter down button and it puts the wing wheels down and lowers the transport wheels as well. Then we're going to hold the fold button and push the same exact hydraulic lever and it folds the planter out. I also had somebody ask what this box is. I'm going to power it up right now. This is actually the control center for our AMVAC smart box insecticide system. That's all those white boxes that you see on the backs of the row units. Those are dispensing insecticide into the furrow on top of the seed 
before the furrow is closed to protect the roots of the plants from damage from insects. It's a very small amount. It's uh, four ounces per thousand feet of row. It turns out to be just about four pounds per acre that we're putting on. I had somebody ask the other day if we plant the end rows first or if we come in and plant those after we've planted the middle of the field. We do plant the end rows first. It works better that way for us. Okay, we gotta set our engine speed. So we just go to the touch screen here on the John Deere console and hit the uh, engine button. And I've got my engine field cruise speed set at 1800 RPM. So I turn on the field cruise, put the check mark there. And then the engine will only run 1800 RPMs when I have the throttle all the way ahead. All right, I'm auto steering, planter down, and we're going. So we aren't using the markers anymore because we're using GPS to auto steer the end rows now. But I'll show you how they work. You just push the right marker button while you've got the planter down and out goes the marker. And what that does, the marker is half as long as the planter is. So when we get to the end and turn around, that mark will actually be exactly where we need to center the middle of the tractor to be able to drive perfectly along for the next swath. You can see the mark that it's making. I run in ninth gear, that's five miles per hour. So if everything works right, the GPS should drive us right down that marker track. Oops, I didn't, I didn't get the button pushed. I thought I did. So there we go, right down the marker track. So if I was driving it, I would be looking at the marker track and uh, trying to keep the middle of the tractor centered on it. That's how we used to plant corn exclusively before we had GPS. Dad had a 12 row planter with markers on it and sometimes when the dust was flying at the end of the day and the sun was in your eyes, it was nearly impossible to see that marker. Okay, row 15 claims it's not planting. Let's go see why. So I've got the blower going, I've got the hose removed from the row unit and nothing's coming out of it. So I'm gonna go bang on it a little bit. Oh boy, here we go. I'll load that seed disc with seed and we'll back up and fill that little spot in. I had someone ask me the other day on the first video if it uh, screws up the seed that we've already got in the ground when I back up and go over it again to fill in some rows that didn't plant. I have never noticed the corn looking any different after it comes up in spots that I've done that. And I think the trick is that I'm not running the row cleaners down, plowing the seeds out of the way. And also, it's uh, that disc opener is only going down to the pretty much the exact same depth that the seed is planted at. So even if it does make contact with it, it's not gonna really move it at all because it's just barely gonna touch it. I really don't know why that happened. I didn't see anything come out of the hose that would have been stuck in it. But I've had it before where you get a little piece of paper from a seed bag that gets down in there and plugs things up. Or also a little chunk of gummed up seed treatment. When you see us dumping seed in the planter, you'll notice that it looks green or pink. And that is a seed treatment, a chemical seed treatment that they put on the seed to protect it from all sorts of different perils that could keep it from coming out of the ground. So that stuff, when they put it on the seed, is kind of sticky and wet and gooey and it dries really well. That's another reason that we use the seed lubricant to keep that stuff from getting on the building up on the insides of the hoses between the big hoppers and the little hoppers and from building up on the seed plates. Now 
Now I just got done telling you that we don't use the markers anymore. You can call me a liar now, I guess. I'm just kind of running it as a precaution on a few of these borders that aren't very straight and that are close to the road and everybody can see them. I did the best job I could driving along those borders with the gator, but I'm not sure if it's going to steer it just how I want it to. And if I have to take control and start steering manually, I want to have that marker down so that when I come back with the second pass, I can follow right along with what I did on the first pass. Fun fact, there's the same number of seeds approximately in each bag of seed corn. So the weight of the bag tells you how big the seed is. You'll always have roughly 80,000 seeds in a bag of seed corn. The singulation is struggling because that seed is so light. So I'm actually going to, normally we would run the vacuum at about 20 pounds. I'm going to turn it down to about 14 or 15 and see how it works. So that happens right here on the John Deere display. You just hit the hydraulic section and I've got the fans for the vacuums on two and three. So I'm just going to turn that down about four or five clicks and turn that down about four or five clicks. And you'll see the vacuum go down on the monitor. Looks like I need to hit it a little bit more. Okay, that's more like it. All right, it seems to be getting dialed in a little bit better. We're up to about 99.3, 99.4% singulation. That's pretty good. I like to be around 99.8 to 99.9. That's where we can usually do it. So I'm going to get out at the end here and dig some seed. So I'm going to shut the insecticide system off for the last 100 feet or so. I don't want to get that stuff on my hands while I'm digging for seed. All right, let's see if we can find any. That is a tiny seed. Wow, that guy's little. No wonder it's struggling. All right, in terms of spacing, I just found these four seeds here. These two in the middle are a little close together. I don't like that. But like I say, I think it's struggling a little bit with these small seeds. They might not be coming off the disc as easily as they should. They might want to stick on there because it doesn't take much vacuum pressure to hold a really tiny little seed up in the hole. So I'll get out a few more times in the next hour or two and check on the seed depth and spacing a little bit more. I'm happy with the depth on the seeds that I found. I'm not entirely thrilled with the spacing, but it was still within the acceptable range. So some of the things that can affect seed spacing, if your planter is getting jerked around a lot, if your ripe quality is not very good, which usually is a function of the tillage. If it's really rough and it's shaking the meter all over the place, the seeds might dislodge from the disc in a little bit different way each time. It's all about consistency. You want things to happen exactly the same every time, over and over and over again. So if you have one seed come off the disc just a little bit early, if you hit a bump, and the next seed maybe sticks on the disc just a little bit longer than that one did, you can end up with spacing issues that way. Uh, another thing that can happen if your planter is getting jerked around a lot with poor ride quality is the seed can start bouncing on the way down the tube and if a, if a seed's coming down sliding down the tube really nicely and the next one's bouncing against the sides of the tube and the next one's sliding really nicely that one that's bouncing around is going to be delayed getting to the ground so it'll be a little too close to the seed that comes after it a little too far away from the seed that came before it if your ride quality is really poor you actually have to slow down and drive slower. I've got my monitor showing 95% good ride, which is, that's a good number. For chisel plowed ground especially, that's a really good number. We can get up close to 100% good ride on bean ground, but 95, 96% on corn ground that's chiseled is really good. We don't run the insecticide system on every field and we don't run it every year. I don't think we've even used it for three or four years. We are gonna put some on in the furrow with the planter on about a third of the acres that we're planting this year on some of the farms that have been continuous corn for a long time. Usually if we're rotating back and forth between corn and beans, there's absolutely no reason to worry about corn rootworm problems. And there are a few fields that have been corn, corn, corn for a long time and we've really never experienced rootworm pressure there. But we do have a couple of farms that we definitely have had more pressure than others. So we're putting a little in the furrow this year just as a precautionary to make sure we don't have a bunch of corn laying flat this summer. 
okay, everything is working splendidly right now, so I'm gonna just start going through the list and start answering a few of your questions that you guys have left in the comment section. Thank you so much. Unbelievable response to the last video, the very first planting video that I put out this year. Lots of people taking interest in what's going on and wanting to know more. So I'm gonna try to answer some of your questions right now. I had somebody want to know how big our tractor was and how big the planter was. The planter is a 16 row planter spaced on 30 inches, so it's 40 feet wide. It's a John Deere 1770 NT model that's been retrofitted with a bunch of precision stuff, V-set meters, delta force, downforce, clean sweep, row cleaners. The tractor is a John Deere 8285R, which means that it's 285 horsepower, and it does a great job with this planter. We plant approximately 20% soybeans and 80% corn. Um, we've got about 2,000 acres to get covered this spring, including the custom work that we're doing for a neighbor. So yeah, I hope that answers that question. All right, another fantastic question. Somebody asked, given the complexity of all of this planting equipment and the technical nature of what we're trying to do here and all of the technology involved, do we learn this just by trial and error and by attempting it and failing? Uh, do we read up on it? Is there some school that we go to to learn how to do this? But most of the companies that produce the technologies that we're using with the planter and that produce the seed and all of the things that we're using, most of these companies really care that we get the most out of their product. They want it to go well for us so we keep coming back. And so most all of these companies put on little seminars with a lunch and uh, donuts and coffee and stuff and to entice all the farmers to come in for a free lunch. And then they spend an hour or so explaining to you how their new monitor works, how the new meters work, what the advantages are. It's kind of half sales pitch and half tutorial. A lot of us, once we have some technology in place, if it's upgraded a little bit, it's not a big deal to figure out how to use the new stuff. But if you get something entirely new, a lot of times the salesman will come out and go through it with you and help you set it up and make sure everything's gonna work and make sure that you understand what you're doing. They want you to get the most out of it. Well, shoot, this is not exactly what I wanted. The test is still flying. <laughs> uh, I really want to get to the end of the field so I'm not stuck out here in the middle if it actually downpours. So I'm going to keep going. Well, it rained just enough that I'm getting a little mud sticking to the row cleaners and it's not ideal but it's just on the surface, I know, because there's still dust coming up from underneath. So I'm gonna sit here for 15 minutes and let the wind blow and let the top dry off again so that I don't have dirt sticking. While I'm doing this, I think I'm gonna put the GoPro on my head and get out and show you one of the meters and the seed tubes and answer a couple questions about that so you can see a little closer how this works to pick up and drop seed. Okay, so I'm just going to take this meter off and show it to you. I can just pull the vacuum hose right off it, pull the seed fill hose right off, unclamp it, and over here there is an electrical connector that I can unplug. And then we just lift it right off. Okay, now I can lay it down and take this side off without losing all the corn. So you can see the corn lays in there coming down from the mini hopper and then here's the seed disc that rotates now the vacuum hose is connected right here so it's sucking air through all of those little holes and as they rotate around they pick up a seed out of the bottom here and take it up here and this piece right here is called the singulator see the seed passes by each one of these little notches and they wiggle the seed back and forth on the hole and what that does, if you've got more than one seed stuck to one hole, this, this singulator rocking the seed back and forth will actually knock one of those seeds off and drop it back down into here. And if the seed makes it all the way up and through the singulator, then when it gets to here, it drops off and goes down into the seed tube. There's also, if you can see behind here, there's a little rotating wheel. Let me just take this disc off and show you. 
This is the uh, knockout wheel, and this is to make sure that the seed comes off. It kind of pokes through the hole. You can kind of see it right there when it's going by. And it also, if you ever have a little chunk of broken seed that gets stuck in the hole, that knockout wheel is supposed to knock that out. Okay. So then when your seed falls down here, it goes into the seed tube. Let me take that off and show it to you as well. Ouch. So this is the seed tube that carries the seed from the meter all the way down and drops it in the furrow at the bottom. And it has a sensor on it that can see through the tube and every time a seed goes by it senses that seed and it can do it extremely fast so that's how we're able to tell our seed spacing we're able to tell our singulation so that's pretty cool i guess the neighbor doesn't think it's too wet to be planting he's still going pretty sandy up there on his place okay i'm gonna put this back together and we should be able to get up and roll in here in a second. That's all there is to it. Good grief, guess what? So I was crossing my arms and I just heard this crinkling sound in my pocket. And I'm like, okay, let's get in there and figure out what's going on. I got a piece of candy in there or something. Look what I pulled out. Money. I saw a zero and I'm like, 10, 20. Look at this. I just pulled a $50 bill out of my shirt pocket that's been hanging in my closet for months clean, washed. What am I going to do? I guess I could start by buying a new shirt. <laughs> it's a good day. It's always a good day. But things like this, that's awesome. So I'm going to be out of seed in about 10 minutes. I'm going to have to stop and put a different hybrid in. And that brings up a really good question that someone else asked. In fact, a lot of people have asked this. Uh, basically, just generally wanting to know about why we plant different companies seed, why we plant different hybrids, how we decide where which hybrid is going to go, which fields we're going to put it on, and what the difference is between 101 day corn, 110 day corn, what that number means. It's all about genetics. When you think about any type of animal, you don't want to bring an African elephant to somewhere where it's constantly frozen. You don't want to take penguins and put them in the Sahara Desert, every animal thrives in a certain environment. And genetically speaking, corn seed is the same way. When we're selecting corn to put on a certain field, we know the history of that field, we know what disease pressure there is in that field, we know what soil types we have and what our drainage situation is. Is it kind of always wet? Is it a really light, sandy, dry field? And every hybrid has a different suitability rating for all of those different things. So when we sit down to figure out what seed we're going to plant where, we're basically doing our best with the help of the seed dealer and the brochures and uh, Farmers Business Network has a really good tool for choosing seed based on your soil type, on your particular field that you have loaded in. We're trying to maximize the potential for success of the crop. And in terms of buying from different companies, we like to have genetics from all different companies. Um, we don't like to be married to just one. The number of days associated with the hybrid of corn, right now I'm planting 109 day corn. And on the other half of this farm, I'm gonna be planting 105 day and 106 day corn. And what that is, is a measure of relative maturity. That's the days to maturity. That doesn't mean that I'm planting it today, that exactly 101 days later, we can harvest it, or 109 days later. That's not how it works. But on a sliding scale, your 101 day corn is gonna be mature 
and it's going to be dry and ready to harvest far before your longer season corns. The longest number that we've planted this year is 114 day corn. And people might ask, why would you plant longer season corn? Because in the fall, you're running the grain dryer, spending money, burning gas to dry your corn. If you just planted short season corn, you wouldn't have to dry it as much in the fall. And that's true, we could harvest it earlier. But the real large yield potential often almost always lies with the longer, fuller season hybrids. Usually, all things being equal, weather conditions being fine, your 114 day corn should blow your 100 day corn out of the water in terms of yield potential. Things don't always go right. It doesn't always work out that way. But in terms of spreading your risk, once again, we want to plant all sorts of different maturity levels of corn. And in our area, 100 day corn to 114 day corn is pretty much the window. Up north, you would never be, in Minnesota, you would never be planting 114 day corn. You don't have a long enough growing season. So I told you earlier that we always plant the end rows first before we start planting the middle of the field. Somebody asked about that in the comments. Right now, I'm actually doing the opposite of what I told you. I have a farm where there's a longer season hybrid going along the fence line over there where we always have to start planting this field and then a shorter season over here. And I didn't want to have longer season end rows blocking in the shorter season corn in case that other corn is ready first and we can't pick the end rows off because they're way too wet. So I set up a digital simulated headland on the monitor which basically moves the field boundary in 80 feet to trick the planter into shutting off where the end rows would be. And now I can come along and plant the end rows in after I've planted the middle. Let me show you why I don't like doing this. When you uh, plant the field first, you set the planter down a little bit before it actually starts planting. And so now I'm bouncing over all of the tracks that I made perpendicular to this with the planter and it, I'm having to go really slow. It's not ideal. But it sure is slick to be able to do it that way and to have it come out this nice and make it look like you planted the end rows first. That's pretty sweet. So look at this, this is pretty cool. I was just using the boundary track to plant in the end rows so I didn't have to steer along the fence here. And now I'm getting ready to go back into the straight track across the field. So I just hit this swap track line, boom. There's my field track. Well, I stopped and put seed in the planter at the office, changed the insecticide boxes, and I'm deeply saddened by this latest weather development. Well, it didn't rain much, but it rained just enough. There's no way I'm going to get back in the field tonight. Well, sadly, that's going to do it for today, everybody. It's going to be an early quit to the day. Um, I didn't get probably as far as I wanted to down the list of answering your questions in this video. I'm going to upload what I've got here today. And if I didn't get around to your question, I'll try to chat with you quick in the comments section and let you know if your question is coming up in an upcoming video. Uh, or I'll just answer it in the comments if uh, it's a short question. So, as always, thanks for riding along with me. Thanks for hanging out, and I'll see you next time.